So this is the third video in the lecture on pandemics for technology and civilization two. Um, and in the previous lecture, I was talking about the sort of shift from 1918 Spanish influenza up to the 1960s and 1970s, where there were increasingly successful public health campaigns tackling infectious disease, declining rates of infectious disease in developed countries. And this idea by the 1970s that we had vanquished infectious diseases, a serious public health threat, at least in developed countries, maybe in developing countries around the world, it was a concern. And then people were questioning, you know, the return on investment in medicine for mortality rates and this concern about whether public health was the way to invest money or just focusing on economic uplift in general. And something happened. And so now I'm going to talk about the resurgence of infectious disease and pandemics in the last 40 years. And the first something that happened was in the 1980s in the United States. Again, if you looked at public health schools in the 1980s at the beginning, the departments that focused on infectious disease really were focused on looking at this in the developing world. They were not concerned as much about infectious disease in the United States. And suddenly there was this mysterious uh, disease happening in the United States, people's immune systems compromised, they were dying of diseases that normally people didn't die of in, in America in the 1980s. And very quickly they realize that there is this new virus that's causing uh, an immune comprom a com compromised immune system known as a HIV and AIDS. And the first case appeared in 1981. So very early 80s this appears and it's spreading, but it's initially a spreading in marginal populations, especially homosexuals, but also intravenous drug users. And these are communities that the mainstream America was not concerned about and paying attention to. So much the way that influenza in 1918 appears in the poor, and this causes people to be slow to react uh, to seeing it as a threat to uh, the rest of America, when AIDS appears in the 1980s, people are slow to see it as a real problem for mainstream America, and really it's something for these marginal populations that they shouldn't worry about. So countries are slow to act. If the first case appeared in April 1981, it wasn't until September of 1985 that President Reagan first mentions the words AIDS in public. So four years pass with it spreading in many different communities before the president even acknowledges that this, this epidemic is occurring. And if you think about the question I asked you, when did it get real? Well, because many heterosexuals were not concerned about the gay community, it was really with public cases like Magic Johnson in 1991 uh, announced that he had AIDS, um, that people started, or HIV AIDS, that people started to realize that even non-homosexuals and non-drug users were, were at risk of this epidemic. And so that's when you see a real sea change in how the public was looking at the disease. Uh, similarly, this is something you hear about today, with the coronavirus, uh, with the HIV AIDS, there was a lot of foot dragging at the Food and Drug Administration with uh, drug treatments and testing. And so you can see in these images in this slide that there was sort of concerted effort by AIDS activists to try to force the FDA to hurry up with drugs that were found to be effective. In response to these heavy protests in 1987, the FDA issued new rules to expedite approval of drugs like AZT, which is a really important uh, suppressant for the uh, AIDS virus, uh, for all life-threatening diseases. So it, they expanded pre-approval access to these drugs for patients with the idea that even though there might be risk of the drugs, these are life-threatening illnesses, and so they have to expedite approval. And why did this appear? Again, we, we had defeated infectious disease and it looked like this would be a problem of the past, and suddenly you have this mysterious new disease appearing. And the answers are twofold. One is that it is traced back to Africa, and so this is an example of globalization. A, a disease that occurs around the world, in a different place, finds its way into the United States and elsewhere, because of the greater mobility. You have the rise of commercial aviation, people are moving around the world more, um, disease outbreaks that occur in other continents can very quickly find their way into, into our country. And also, and you can see a bunch of images here, 
you have this problem of zoonosis. A lot of diseases which appear in human populations that are new often are transferred uh, from their diseases that first occur in other animals. And in the case of HIV, uh, it's pretty clear that you can find similar viruses in other apes. And so very quickly, the scientists start to postulate that probably this, this virus was in another ape, maybe a chimpanzee, and then either the chimpanzee bit a human because it has to be passed through the blood, or there is a, a trade in bushmeat. So in some communities in Africa, people will, will eat apes, and so there are people who hunt them, and they speculate that people who are hunting apes were in close proximity with them and might have been infected, and then it spread. Um, so again, this concern about zoonosis, the idea that, that close proximity with animals might be a potential threat of disease spread, uh, and then the, the idea that with globalization it would spread around the world should hopefully still sound familiar to you. And I'm going to come back to this. But this was sort of the, the two mechanisms for how HIV AIDS suddenly became a concern. And this is a story that could be told over and over and over again. So since the 1980s, we have had a series of these kinds of outbreaks where some kind of new virus that was transferred from some kind of animal into human beings and through globalization becomes a potential threat. Uh, one of those is a little different. HIV AIDS compromises people's immune systems. And so since the 1980s, there has been a resurgence of tuberculosis. It was relatively rare in the 1970s, but there were enough people who were immune compromised, uh, also among drug users, that you suddenly start to have populations uh, or small populations in urban centers of tuberculosis, and then this starts to affect other people. And so suddenly the successful conquest of tuberculosis becomes a new problem, and now people have to get tested. And this is why you have the TB test now. Um, but then you have these other new, new diseases. In the 1990s and again in the 2000s, teens, you have Ebola. In 2003, you have SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coming out of, they believe, Hong Kong. And then again, five years later in 2008, influenza A, often called bird flu, that they believe might have come out of Hong Kong. In 2009, we have H1N1, which is popularly called swine flu, that's, that originates in the United States, resulted in 12,469 deaths in the United States. And in the 2000s, you have the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that I mentioned that I had I was in Korea when this broke out in Korea. And one journalist who was looking at all of these different cases wrote that the list of such viruses emerging into humans sounds like a grin drumbeat. And he starts to name off a bunch. Machupo in Bolivia, 1961. Marburg, Germany, 1967. Ebola, Zare in Sudan, 1976. HIV, recognized in New York and California, 1981. A form of Hanta, southwestern United States, 1993. Hendra, Australia, 1994. Bird flu, Hong Kong, 1997. Nipah, Malaysia, 1998. West Nile, New York, 1999. SARS, China, 2002. MERS, Saudi Arabia, 2012. Ebola, again, West Africa, 2014. And he didn't say this, but coronavirus, 2019, China. So you can get this sense about the sudden resurgence of these diseases. And again, Often the formula that seems to be occurring is that you have zoonotic diseases, close proximity between humans and animals, and globalization that makes the chance of spread much greater. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but this could be something you can talk about in discussions. But another reason why you have a resurgence of certain infectious diseases is the growth in the anti-vaccination movements, um, often called anti-vaxxers, and in particular for measles, mumps, and pertussis. So we have vaccines for these. A century of campaigns led to their disappearance, um, and in some ways their success is why we have this new new problem, which is that many people feel like they're not a threat, um, they are concerned about the vaccine, uh, think about the case, the Jacobson versus Massachusetts case where the person says, I have moral reservations about this, and these people want to opt out of vaccination, and if the numbers of them are large enough, and the possibility of these diseases spreading again increases. And that's what's happened. You've had outbreaks of these diseases in different communities. Now, what you need to keep in mind is at the beginning of the, 19, of the 20, 1900s, 
Jacobson versus Massachusetts set out the right of the state to make these things mandatory. But in practice, in the United States, they have not been. In practice, most of the time, it's been done on a voluntary basis where it's been a strongly encouraged thing. For certain vaccines, if you're going to be in the school system, you should do this. If you opt out of the school system, you can opt out of those vaccines. Um, and so now we have this movement of people who argue that this is a personal choice, um, and we have a backlash to these people as well. Now, I think this is often set up as a binary debate between people who are anti-science, um, who are being irrational, and then people who feel like this is a personal liberties question and are, are upset with other people trying to ch you know, challenge their personal choice. It's a much more complicated story, but it is something to think about, which is you know, how much and how would you try to uh, oblige people to take on this pro-public health uh, position, uh, given the fact that if people don't do this, it becomes a threat for those who are, are more vulnerable, especially children. Uh, I think about this with my own daughter, who are unable to get those vaccines in the, in, until a certain age and therefore more exposed. And given this drumbeat of infectious diseases that I just described, one could ask, was it possible to predict the coronavirus pandemic of 2020? Could have been a predicted? And honestly, the answer is yes. Um, if you look, you can see a lot of evidence for this. Um, in uh, 2006 or 2005, uh, President Bush said that if we wait for a pandemic to appear, it will be too late to prepare. Um, he said this because he had read this book by... Um, Barry Johnson about the 1918 pandemic, and he found it so compelling that he was said this is a, a hundred year risk, and we are a hundred years now from this. Um, and so he said it was important for us to prepare for that. Uh, the National Security Council in, uh, in 2016 published what was known as the Pandemic Playbook. We are not following the Pandemic Playbook, even though it has been in existence. Um, but they did this to basically say, how do we prepare for this? Last year, the U.S. government ran a simulation called Crimson Contagion, where they ran through different scenarios, including a pandemic like this, and they did predictions about how we would react and respond. My own family has a friend, Lawrence Wright, who's a novelist and a Pulitzer Prize winner, who has a book coming out right now. He wrote it last fall, and this novel imagines a global pandemic that emerges out of China. It's a respiratory illness, highly infectious. It kills millions. Um, this was a fictional novel he wrote, and he said he not has any special prescience or foresight. He just was talking to experts. He knew that this could happen, and part of his effort to make it realistic. And here we are. He has a book coming out right now amidst all of this. Now, in his book, he imagined that governments would take this seriously and react much more concertedly and in a much more coordinated way than they have in practice. And he's, he said that he was surprised. He did not predict that governments would be so disorganized. Uh, in the country I lived in years ago, South Korea, they had their first test, tested case the same day the United States did, and they were prepared. And part of the reason they were prepared is because they experienced MERS five years ago. And so unlike the United States, they took it very seriously. They realized what was coming. Um, so yes, we could have predicted this. People have been predicting this. Um, there is a scientist who studies coronaviruses in bats, and he was quoted saying, we've been raising the flag on these viruses for 15 years, ever since SARS. So this brings us to the coronavirus, right? And what lessons can we draw between what's happening today and what we've seen in these past pandemics? Um, one of the things I'll say is that it is very common when these pandemics arise to start falling into a moral blame game. Like, what is to blame? Who should we blame? And the tendency is to oversimplify where blame falls. So for example, obviously globalization is a key reason for why an outbreak that occurred in China is now all around the world. Um, but the desire to make this about East Asia to say that this is all the fault of China really ignores the extent to which our markets and, and all of us in the world are heavily interlinked and therefore our health is linked as well. So even though it's, it's it's tempting to say that because this originated in one place in the world, it's their fault for letting it get out, the truth is, is these, these diseases are emerging in many different places around the world. 
and the mechanism for how they become a global economic is shared. We have integrated markets, integrated commodity flows, and people are constantly traveling, they're doing tourism, Americans are as guilty as this as anyone else, and that is how these, these epidemics spread. Part of what I think made America slow to react was that we were thinking this was an East Asia problem. Uh, this was not the reaction that Korea, Japan, and Taiwan had. So when there was an epidemic uh, announced in January in China, Korea, Japan, and Taiwan realized this was going to come. And that was why they started taking steps in January and February, and that was why they were much more prepared. I think countries in Europe and the United States were in denial. We had this idea that, no, this is an East Asian problem, and that is why we're now facing the same, the same kind of explosion that we saw in, in other countries. And again, coronavirus is believed to become to come either from a bat or a pangolin. Um, there's lots of discussion about how this is the fault of wet markets in China. Wet markets are open food markets where live animals are sold. Um, and these are very common in Asia, and it is true that they were, have also been credited with the spread of bird flu uh, when it arose. And so it's tempting for people to say, well, this is the problem. It's these crazy Chinese people. Um, they're eating, they're involved in the trade of these exotic animals, or they're you know, trading and eating things like bats, and this is why they're unnecessarily exposing us. However, I would want to point out that it is not just the Chinese that have zoonotic diseases. Um, they're very common in the United States. Many countries don't want to buy American beef because they think that we have a higher rate of E. coli outbreaks or mad cow disease, and, and people don't trust our our measures on this, and we have had many uh, E. coli bacteria outbreaks on our beef, and that is because we have close quarters of cattle. Much like in China, these outbreaks have been driven by close human-animal interactions. You can see this as well in the United States, and you can see this in other places where these disease emerge. Um, so it's tempting to, to blame other cultures for their odd practices, but it's really more about this intensification of food production. Now, one interesting thing I want you to be aware of is what's known as the One Health Movement. Instead of focusing on weird, bizarre human animal interactions, in veterinary schools and increasingly in other schools, people are saying what we really need to do is stop thinking of animals as separate from us and start recognizing that humans, animals, and the environment all have a kind of shared health. And so if animals are being raised in an environment where their health is at risk, that will eventually cross over and translate into human health problems or and vice versa. Um, and same with the environment. And so if we work on improving the environment in which people and animals live, that would have a, a reduction of risk. So this One Health Movement is an effort to say we need to be aware of this human-animal environment relationship and understand that these outbreaks of disease reflect the, the lack of health in all three areas. And the third thing might sound really obvious, but the classic thing that happens when pandemics start to rise is that in the moral blame game is that people start politicizing the pandemic. Um, they try to transform the natural disaster into an assignment of fault and political blame. And this is unavoidable, but invariably they choose sort of very narrow explanations that with time are found to be incorrect. They want to blame foreigners. They want to say that this is because foreigners came when, when their own uh, countrymen are also traveling around. They want to ignore our economic dependence on other countries, and that is why we have this kind of flow of people and, and diseases. And people want to blame their political opponents. They want to say that the other people, the other political party didn't react the way they should have. Now, what's in, from a public health point of view, viruses don't have politics. Um, the virus doesn't care what your political party is. It doesn't care whether you're foreign or not foreign. Um, perhaps the only thing the virus may end up caring about and people might try to turn into a morality tale is that it is different if you live in a very high-density population urban area than if you live in a rural low-density area. And it is likely that in the short term people are going to think, well, New Yorkers, they live in this high-density place and therefore this disease proves the dangers of that. Um, I think people in rural communities are going to be surprised to find how integrated theirs are with these urban centers and how the disease will eventually come to these rural communities too. But it is true that viruses grow and expand and spread much more rapidly when there's close proximity. And so it's going to be different for countries like the United States and our suburban areas than it is in the countries where my family lives in Italy and Spain. So now it's here, 
the other question with this pandemic is what can be done? Now, historically, there are several paths forward, and probably the, the, the first reaction people have to what to do when a pandemic starts or an epidemic starts to occur is containment. They try to contain the, the, the disease where it originated. Um, people, you can think about the classic historical problems uh, that they would do. They close their borders. They try to keep outsiders out. Um, this is that image again that I showed you related to cholera in the New York, cholera entering the New York, where they try to create a barricade. Um, this is a classic response. Reinforce the borders, keep them out. And while it does slow an epidemic from arriving, it usually doesn't stop the epidemic from coming because commerce and trade always works against it. Very few places can afford to keep out commerce and trade, and so eventually containment tends to, to give way to um, some kind of exposure and what else to do. So in the case of the United States, the ship has sailed. The World Health Organization was slow to call it, but on March 11th said this is a pandemic, this is everywhere, and we need to change our strategy. So the next approach that people often tackle, and, and I'm going to make a joke about my home state of Texas here, is that we just let the disease move through the community. Um, eventually, people coming on the other side will have, if not full immunity from the illness that they've experienced, they'll have some partial immunity. Enough people will gain this, it's what's known as herd immunity. If enough of the population has some level of immunity, then it won't spread as, as badly again. Um, so this, I'm calling this swallow the bad medicine. Um, a Texas lieutenant governor sort of infamously stated that our grandparents might take a risk and have to die for this, but they'd be willing to do this if it meant that we could keep the economy going. And there's this crude meme circulating, I don't know if you've seen it, where it says the coronavirus is the boomer remover. Um, it's awful, although it's kind of funny in a, in, a, in a dark way. But the idea being that, you know, this disease is mostly affecting older people. Now, this has been shown to not be true. There is a risk for younger people, um, but it mostly seems to affect older people and people with pre-existing governments. It's not just Texas lieutenant governors and insensitive uh, millennials who are proposing this. Initially in England, they took this approach that they would let the disease come through and encourage the most vulnerable to just simply, you know, sit it out. And uh, now they've changed their mind on this and, and realized that this would be difficult on their healthcare system. Sweden continues to have this approach, but the risk is that you're going to end up flooding your healthcare system and that will then potentially lead to higher death rates. So the second path forward is where the United States is right now, where most states are, which is this idea of social distancing and a lockdown. Now, if you look at this, this animated GIF, it shows the principle here, which is that if you allow the disease to move through the population quickly, you're gonna have lots of infections. Some percentage of those are gonna be hospitalized and eventually it's gonna exceed the, the hospital's uh, capacity and that you'll therefore have more deaths because people get worse care. If you can slow down the rate of interactions, this is slowing down the economy as well, then you flatten the curve and make it easier for the medical system to meet the need and that will lower the amounts of death. Now at some level, this socialization looks a lot like this medieval solution I was talking about in Boccaccio's Decameron, the idea that people go and they sit it out, and it seems like the same sort of antisocial approach. But actually, it's a bit more complicated. In a way, this approach is based on this shared sense of responsibility and resources. You ask the question, what is the healthcare system's capacity, which is different for every country and every state, and then can we sacrifice our individual liberties if it means that our communal resources will be better put to use to help everyone? Um, so you have these suggestions about individualistic behaviors like self-isolating or victory gardens, which frame it as a kind of crisis that the individual needs to be self-sufficient about. But I think that social distancing and lockdown, this idea of flattening the curve, is actually more about thinking about this collectively. How can we collectively respond to the crisis? And my own hometown of Austin, Texas, nicely illustrates this, illustrates this paradox we're in right now. Here you can see two images um, on the right you can see images from a video that was circulating about Austin after spring break. And the big story was that South by Southwest was canceled. If you know anything about Austin, I'm an Austinite, this was a big deal. You know, this huge uh, conference that gets lots of attention, is big for the economy, was canceled because they wanted to make sure that they didn't spread 
this illness. And so the video shows all of these images of Austin, Texas deserted, right? And it looks sort of like this crisis. Meanwhile, on the left, you can see a story of 44 University of Texas at Austin students who for spring break the same week went down to Mexico and partied on the beaches. And then when they came back, they tested positive for coronavirus because apparently they had, they had been exposed on their spring break trip. So looking at these two questions, which of these would you say is a more antisocial response? I'm kind of begging the question here, but in the video where it's talking about the empty streets of Austin, it says, when you see the empty streets, the empty stadiums, the empty trains platforms, don't say to yourself, it looks like the end of the world. What you're seeing in that negative space is how much we do care for each other, for our grandparents, for our immunocompromised brothers and sisters, for people we will never meet. Take a moment when you're on your walk, on your way to the store, or just watching the news to look into the emptiness and marvel at all of that love. It isn't the end of the world. It is the most remarkable act of global solidarity we may ever witness. What the video is trying to say is that this is not an antisocial act. We are doing this out of a sense of solidarity. In fact, some people say it should be rewritten. It shouldn't be called social distancing. It should be called physical distancing and social solidarity. And this word solidarity, I hear all the time in Europe. It's this idea of a unity or a agreement, a, a feeling or action um, where individuals have a common interest. And I think it's a really useful word to think about th throughout this crisis. And the role of technology, this is important. I've been talking about medical technologies, but now I want to think about digital technologies because conventionally when social scientists and historians have looked at technologies, um, particularly these new digital technologies, the concern has been that they are transforming our social relationships and potentially for the worse. There's a great book out by an anthropologist, Sherry Turkle, called Alone Together, where she studies two technologies, cell phones and social robots. And one of the things she asks about is, does this technology contribute to social isolation and antisocial behaviors? Is our use of cell phones when we're with other people causing us to be alone even when we're together? We're not looking and building the emotional ties with each other because we're too focused on the more superficial and tenuous social interactions on things like Facebook, Instagram, and such. And the worry is that this is leading to kind of loneliness. But now we're in this very unique situation. We are all forced to be at home, disconnected, potentially isolated, and suddenly it is the availability of these, these tools that allow us to reach out to others. Um, so you have Auburn University history faculty meetings happening through Zoom. You have remote teaching, like this video that I'm giving you, and the possibility of, of office hours with your professors. Um, you have these quarantine concerts where people, where famous people are sort of giving music concerts and encouraging their viewers to come in. And all of these, it becomes a kind of social lifeline. So there's a kind of inversion of this idea of cell phones and the internet is encouraging social isolation, but instead an opportunity for us to feel a, a social breath of air. Now, last, I wanted to say one other path forward. We have talked about the idea that we needed to let the disease go through, the path that the United States is mostly focused on right now, and this is the path that you saw in Italy and Spain and in the epicenter at Wuhan in China, which is the idea of a lockdown. But there is a different way. South Korea has had a very different experience with the, the disease because from the initial entrance into the country, they did aggressive contact tracing. Contact tracing is where when you find out of someone, you do lots of testing. And when someone tests positive for this, you then find out every person they've been exposed to for the period of time that they might have had the, the illness. And then they create a tree and they reach out to those people and they find out who those people have been around. And then they create another tree. And for all of these people that you trace, you tell them to self-isolate for a period of time, in the case of coronavirus, 14 days. And the idea is that they then are reducing the exposure. And if you get everybody who's exposed to the disease, you can reduce its spread. And it's never going to reach zero because this thing has spread too much, but you keep it low enough that then the healthcare system can manage the patients who do come in and need to be treated. Now, they've used a lot of interesting technologies to do this. Uh, rather than requiring people to go into hospitals, they were the first to set up drive-through testing so people could drive through with their cars. 
Um, they have developed apps that can be downloaded onto cell phones, and anyone who tests positives has to have this app and thing, and others will use it. And if you are traveling around and come into contact who's with someone who's later identified to have the virus, then the app automatically notifies you that you were on the same metro train car as that person, or you were in the same store as that person at some point in time, and be aware that you may need to get tested. And so they, they would then go through the drive through to see if they've, they've developed the virus as well. Now, this is excellent in terms of surveillance. It makes it possible for people to still go out and live their lives. So Korea is not in a lockdown. It's a third way of doing this. Um, but it does mean that your liberty to move around comes at the cost of your privacy, that all of your movements are being surveilled, and that if you are targeted as someone who's who's been exposed to this, then you will immediately, you know, everyone around you is going to be, their privacy is going to be invaded as well in the name of keeping you all at home. Um, so you have no privacy, but in exchange, the economy can keep moving at a kind of slower pace. The reason why Korea was able to set this up again, was because of its experience with MERS. Um, it, it realized that it needed to act aggressively. One of the mistakes that it made with MERS is that they did not provide enough information to people, and that led to people becoming worried and acting out on their own or taking it for granted. And so they have had an aggressive form of government transparency. They constantly inform the public who has been infected, what are the outcomes of those people, um, what are their demographics, where have they been, and the public then is able to react to that and, and, and try to offset their risk. I've included a link to a YouTube video where you can learn more about this. It's very interesting uh, to think about. Um, one of the concerns, of course, is that during a crisis, this might be fine. People might be okay with giving up their privacy. But how can we be sure, once this infrastructure is, is in place, that it will go away after the crisis? It could be that people are okay with losing their privacy right now for the sake of the common public health. Um, but what happens then later? Will people be okay with the fact that there is this surveillance technology um, in the future after the 18 months that we're hopefully waiting? We are in the middle of this, so it is hard to predict where we are headed next. If you've really been paying attention, the background to this, to this lecture, the background to this slide, which is from Johns Hopkins COVID-19 map, has been different uh, in the different places where I've used it throughout the lecture. I took screen captures of this, this web page over the course of the week that I spent writing this lecture. And over the course of that week, the global count in ca infection cases rose from under a million to well over a million. And we still have to face the worst of this. Um, there will be many, many more people infected. So we are in the middle of this, and it's really hard to know where they're going. And it can be um, quite alarming. That said, perhaps my favorite quote that I have read in all of this from an expert epidemiologist talking about this outbreak, um, he was being interviewed, he was trying to explain about what a concern this, this, this outbreak is, but then he said, this is not a zombie apocalypse. All right, even though the risk is real, even though it's going to be dangerous and there will be people whose lives are lost, um, this is not the zombie apocalypse, this is not the end of times. Um, and the past here can also be a comfort. We have experienced pandemics before and society has moved on. We will eventually move on from this one too. And it will be interesting to see what we learn from it. In the meantime, thank you and stay home, stay safe, and stay healthy.